Good evening all and welcome. Before we begin, two notices. The first being that some of the stories today are extremely graphic, so viewer discretion is advised, especially for story 8. The second being, I would like for you to welcome my good friend, Killer Orange Cat, who has agreed to share four stories in today's video. They are very good stories in my personal opinion and definitely worth a listen to. I really enjoyed them. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This happened in the Philippines in 2012. I was 18 at the time and living in a residential district by my university where most of the structures are apartments and dormitories for rent. I was living in an apartment with my sister. Unlike my sister, I usually didn't go home on the weekends because I would rather drink with my friends. One night, while I was on my way to a party, a guy messaged me on Grinder. He had no profile picture, and seeing that he is less than a mile away, I figured that perhaps he might go to the same university that I did, and being discreet about it. I don't remember the entire conversation, but it pretty much went like this. What's up, sexy? I'm heading out to a party. You? Really? Same. Where? I was aware of stranger danger back then, but I felt invincible because of my height and lean athletic body. I didn't get scared easily. I sent him the name of the club. The grinder guy replies, What a coincidence, I'll see you there. Sure, mind sending me a pic? I'll find you, the grinder guy replies. I didn't reply, and actually didn't care because my plan was to just enjoy the night and see where it goes. So I headed out around 10pm, still considered a safe hour in the city where I was staying, and walked a few blocks to the main street, and then waited for my female friend who lived in the district on the other side of the main street to pick me up. We headed to the party and met up with my other friends there. We took our seats in a booth with couches and ordered four drinks. Our orders came, and for a while everything seemed normal, and I honestly had forgotten about the guy on Grinder completely. The waiter then headed in our direction, bringing a glass of martinis and handing it to me. He said in our language, it's from the guy over there, and I looked in the direction he was pointing, trying to adjust my vision to see through the laser lights and smoke. I saw this Nordic looking scruffy muscular guy in a hooded sweater who raised his glass as our eyes met, smiling before he took a sip. My friend started teasing me and kept telling me to go talk to him, but I didn't want to at first. After this, most of my friends were leaving their seats to dance. I couldn't do anything because I was thinking about the guy. It took me about 30 minutes to muster the courage to finally approach him. I could remember the next events that happened vividly, not only because it was awkward, but I have never felt so threatened in my life. I sat next to him at the bar and it seemed like he just paid for his drinks and was about to leave. Being a natural flirt, I knew I had to stop him and score one for the night, like get his number and get to know more about him. Hey, I said. I realized that he may be a foreigner, which is typical because there are a lot of them in the city. Thanks for the drink, I said out loud, trying to get my words in through the music. He just nodded. Are you the guy from Grinder? He smiled. It was weird because it almost felt like he was trying to be seductive, but at the same time hard to get, and at the same time it looked like he didn't have a clue. At that point I was already giving up trying to start a conversation. I didn't know what was the point of giving me a drink if he didn't want to talk to me. Maybe he didn't like me when he saw me up close? With that thought in my head, I decided it was time for me to go. Well, see you round, I said. But before I could turn around, he grabbed my shoulder gently. Come with me, he said. It sounded like an order at first, with a hint of aggression. I thought it was just because of the accent, but it made me nervous. No stranger had ever told me to come with them in the way he did. Sorry, I'm with my friends, but maybe we can hang out another time. Let's go, he insisted. I wasn't freaking out at first because we were in a public place until he stood up from the stool. I may have flinched a little when he put his arm around me, because although I was taller, he looked like he could crush me. Sorry, I really can't, 
if this were another time, but I can't leave my friends. I could hear him grumbling under his breath, but as one of my friends approached us, he let go and walked out of the bar. I felt relieved but at the same time disappointed because the guy was my type until he started ordering me to go with him. My friends kept asking me about him, but I said I didn't seem interested, not wanting to ruin the night for them. I was a little worried because I was thinking that maybe he'd spiked my drink, but then I realized that if it was drugged, the effects would have taken me by now. We left the bar at around 2.30. I hopped in my friend's car and we parted ways with my other friends. Usually the streets would still be busy at this hour, but since it was a weekend it was empty with only a few cars passing by. As we approached a bridge, my friend looked over and was like, You okay? That car's been following us, she said. I looked back and saw a black Toyota Vios. I told her not to worry about it. Perhaps they were taking the same road on their way home. Well, whoever they are, they've been tailing us from the club, she says. I looked back once again, trying to see how many people were inside. That's when I saw it was the same guy from the club. I was immediately worried about my friend. Still thinking rationally, I told her he lived a few miles from me based on Grinder, so maybe it was his way home as well. But when I told her about what happened at the club, she began to panic. I told my friend to stop by at a coffee shop on the way, and thank God there was one open for 24 hours. She didn't want to stop because she was really scared, and if we called the cops, they would probably not do something until something actually happened. We were about to park, but the car with the Nordic looking grinder dude just sped by. We decided that it was safer this way and that we had the wrong assumption. So we headed directly to her house. On our way, the black Vios was nowhere in sight. I told her I would be fine walking on my own to my apartment, although she insisted that she would wake up my brother to drop me off to mine. I told her that it wouldn't be necessary and not to bother her brother because I can protect myself. She knows me, so she gave up and told me to be safe as I headed out. I have never felt threatened walking at this hour because I would usually come home from parties walking in the main street to my apartment and since there was a police station a few blocks away, I really didn't mind. As I made it across the main street from the district to where my friends live, I saw the same damn black files. It was a pretty common car around here, so I tried to calm myself, telling myself it wasn't him and I started speed walking. And although my mind kept telling me to look back, I couldn't do it. I continued speed walking, and that's when I heard a car starting which made me look back. It was the black Vios, and it started to move. There were three things going on in my mind. Run to the apartment, the closest option, as of now. But then to be efficient, when putting the damn key into the keyhole to unlock the door and reveal where you live, or I could run to the coffee shop. Hopefully there's a security guard there that would help me, or run to the police station. My heart felt like jelly and I didn't know what to do. The best option would probably be the coffee shop so I began to run. I wanted to scream while I was running, but it felt like I was out of breath. The black Vios was now ahead of me and it parked a few yards in front. This made me stop, not turn around, stop, completely on my tracks. Fight or flight and I chose fight. I had nothing on me that I could really use. And the last fist fight I had ever been in was in fifth grade, but hell, I felt like I was ready for this. The guy stepped out the car, and it looked like he was holding a small knife. I stood my ground, although I knew I was doomed it would probably be murdered. As the guy approached, the security card from my university called my name. I turned around, and there he was, screeching to a halt on his bicycle. He knew me because there was one time when I'd gone to know him over a coffee. He lived nearby, and I was reminded that he would usually stroll around at this hour. Kuya, I said, feeling relieved. Sort of like an informal sir when you address someone older than you. Before I could even tell him what happened, I heard the car speeding away. The security guard and I went to the coffee shop and I bought him a coffee. He said he was called on by his fellow guard, who couldn't leave the post to scan the area, because apparently they saw a strange guy lurking around the university. He even joked that maybe it was me, but I told him I had just gotten back from the club. I also told him about the stranger and what happened, and if he saw him when he called me. 
He said he didn't, but he noticed the car speeding away. He also said that if I wanted to be escorted to my apartment next time, I should call him, so I gave him my number. I've never heard from the guy since, and I was even planning to set him up using Grinder so we could get his identification, but I couldn't find his profile anymore when I created a new one. So, to the creepy guy who ruined my night, let's not meet. Coming out. This story didn't take place at a Pride celebration. However, it did start because of a Pride celebration. Back in high school, I hung out with a guy named Trent. We were pretty good friends, and, and we were part of a popular clique at school. At the time, I was 16 years old and in the closet. However, a recent interest in gay pride made me begin thinking about coming out of the closet. I really wanted any of my friends who would be interested to come with me to the pride parade that year. So, after some hemming and hawing, I finally braved up enough to come out. This didn't happen very long ago, so it wasn't really a big deal to anyone. Everyone was completely supportive of everything, and some of my friends did accompany me to the parade. Even with the support of my friends, there of course is always someone around who has to bring everyone down. And I guess it was Trent. I mean, it wasn't like he was mean to me or anything. But he sort of quit communicating with me. He just sort of receded. He would continue to hang out at our lunch table, and after school. But he wouldn't talk much anymore. Normally he would sit around, and was one of the more talkative of our group. But this was replaced by him just being quiet and becoming morose. I figured he was just uncomfortable with me, but it didn't make sense really. My other friends told me he had been acting that way when I was not around also. I have to admit I was a little upset that Trent decided not to come out to the parade with us. It would have been nice to have him there, but he didn't. Still, me and my friends that did go had a pretty good time, and that was great. And we got there, really partied, and by the time I got home, I was exhausted. Still, I was sort of on a party high when I got back. When my family went to bed, I was still up. I was watching TV when I heard the neighbor's dog bark a little. I didn't give it much mind at first. It wasn't one of those annoying dogs who barked all the time. I did notice a bit of movement, though. Our television sat in front of our picture window, and I saw something off the side of the window. My eyes adjusted as I noticed a face looking at me from the shadow. After I jumped back, startled, I noticed it was Trent. He was looking just straight at me. Then he moved away. Wondering what was up, I went to the front door and opened it. I was startled and a little scared. But you know, he was a friend of mine, and I had no reason to think that he might have wanted to hurt me. Trent had begun walking away, but stopped when he heard the door open. He stood there and just stared at me. It was so dark that I couldn't see what was going on with his expression. But he just stood there quiet and looked at me. I tried to get him to talk, but he didn't. After a few moments, he turned and walked away. Trent wasn't at school the next day. In fact, none of us saw him at all for about a week. I began feeling bad that perhaps me coming out might have put a strain on the group friendship. When Trent did come back to school, he quit hanging out with us. He became a bit of a loner and just went his own way. After my freshman year of college, I was home for the summer. Late one evening, I heard a knock at the door. I answered it and noticed it was Trent. We just stood there and looked at each other for a very long moment before he grabbed me. I jumped, but realized very quickly that he wasn't trying to hurt me. He kissed me very deeply and then pulled away. After a long and quiet moment, he told me, That's what I should have done three years ago. Trent was closeted and had a crush on me before I came out. But he had convinced himself I was straight and was surprised when I came out. What I had mistaken for homophobia was just nervousness. He wanted to be with me, but he was too scared to actually ask. It wasn't until he lived in a different state in the dorms that he got the nerve to come back and be brave about it. We were both still in college in different states. 
But we had a nice summer fling that year. The story I'm about to share with you happened more than 16 years ago now. I used to work in this place. It was a small office slash school supply store. We used to have regular clients, especially this guy in particular. He was very mysterious, was in his mid 60s and had already retired, but used to go there and just buy anything like he had nothing better to do. He was around 5'11", good looking for his age and very polite. He used to come with his wife and daughter, and I was kind of surprised that he even had a family to begin with, because he pinged my gaydar and no mistake. Anyway, one afternoon he came to the store and I was alone, and he asked me if he could borrow the business phone. I didn't hesitate since I knew him, and he was always very friendly. I remember that someone answered and he asked if he could talk to them. I don't remember the name, but all that I know is that the person he was trying to reach was a man and a young person due to his name. He started talking to him and asking when they were going to see each other. After he hung up, he came to me with a smile and asked me if I was happy. At the time, I was struggling with some personal issues, but responded that I was, and he tells me that you have to follow your heart and don't worry what other people might say about you. I didn't pay too much attention to it at the time, so just kind of forgot about it. A few days went by, and my boss came to the store with a newspaper and told me something disturbing. Hey, do you remember the guy that always comes here? He's found dead in a motel. It was one of those that you paid per hour. Turns out he was stabbed numerous times. I was in shock. Then I remembered my gaydar feelings towards him and him talking on the phone with that guy. He was probably talking with the one who killed him. The police never found the person who did it and his family never followed up trying to find the murderer. I assume but cannot confirm that they were ashamed about his double life. The ride. I realized I was gay at a pretty young age, but I was really too scared to tell anyone. I mean, my family never seemed to have a problem with gays. My mom always liked gay characters on television. But the stigma at the time was not like it is now. Or maybe I was just afraid. I don't know. When I was 16 years old, I had a train pass. I went to a private school that was a few towns over. I knew that the Chicago Pride Parade was going on, and I decided I wanted to go. I had no idea what it would be like. I didn't have any gay friends, and I didn't know any gay people other than me. But I just wanted to experience something, you know? I thought maybe it would make me feel less alone and less isolated. The day of the parade, I got up early in the morning. As I mentioned, this took place in Chicago. So I assumed you had to get there early, as hundreds of thousands of people would be there. The one issue I had is that I only had the train pass. I didn't have a bus pass or much money. I wanted to keep my money for food and possibly a souvenir. So when I got to Union Station, my plan was simply to walk to the area the parade was taking place in. I knew that it was by Wrigley Field, so I decided to walk that way. Well, it was pretty stupid of me, because it was hot as hell outside, and it was a very long walk. If I hadn't brought many bottles of water in my backpack, I probably would have died from dehydration. I'm not sure what part of Chicago I was in when this happened, but it wasn't a very nice area. I stopped at a crosswalk. Even though there were no cars there, there were some people who just walked and I sort of felt like a dumb tourist or something. But eventually, a car did pull up. The man in the car appeared to be maybe in his 50s. He looked at me for a very long time as he was stopped at the green light, and he began to make me very uncomfortable. Hey, you want to get in my car and ride around the block? He asked me. It was a very weird question. Why would I want to ride around the block? I shook my head and told him I was walking north because I wanted to make it to the pride parade. And yeah, looking back again, this was really stupid of me. Well, I just want to go around the block, he told me again. He had a deep accent. 
but I could make out everything he was saying. I said something stupid again. No, sorry. Thanks for the offer, though. I have to get going, I told him, as the light finally changed and the walk sign allowed me to move forward. As I walked the crosswalk, he moved his car forward just a little, blocking me. If you come with me, I'll give you money, he told me. Did he think I was a prostitute or something? I don't know if anybody would be flattered by such a request, but I was not. No thank you, I told him, and tried to walk around the car. Once again he pulled forward, just enough to block me from moving. He then smiled at me, and simply turned, and drove off finally. I felt a wave of relief like I had never felt in my entire life. I crossed the walk and made it to the next block. I badly just wanted to get to the parade because I assumed I would be safe with so many people around. I walked around another ten blocks and looked at the street sign, which told me which block I was on. 1700. That meant I was about halfway to my destination. I sighed and knew by the time this day was over, I was going to be totally exhausted. As I made it to the light at the next block, I jumped a little when I saw the car pull up to the light again. Again, the man asked me to get in his car so we could drive around the block. Again, I declined. I was beginning to get a bit scared of this guy. He kept persisting. When I tried to cross the street, he put his car in my way. He insisted I get in the car, and even told me he would drive me to the parade. I declined, and told him I was fine with walking. I tried to get around his car, but he moved it my way again. I was getting really nervous, but as I tried to go around the car again, he must have put the car in park, because he got out of the car and came after me. He was a big man, and I was a little 16 year old. I tried to run, but he was faster than me and grabbed me by the arm. He started dragging me over towards his car, on the driver's side, towards the back seat. He was way too strong for me to resist, and I assumed he was going to kidnap me, and then who knew what. I screamed for help, but wasn't able to get my entire scream out as he covered my mouth. It seemed so weird for this to happen in the pure daylight. I struggled, I kicked, I tried to bite his hand, I tried anything I could to resist and try to get away, but I couldn't do it. I really thought this man was going to kill me. On the corner of the road was a deli. At the time, I didn't know what had happened, but some sort of luck shined down on me. A huge man wearing an apron, but he looked a lot like Tiny Lister, came out of the deli. What the fuck are you doing? He yelled at the guy trying to kidnap me. This is my son and I'm taking him home, the man told him. It was a stupid story as our ethnicities were very different. The deli worker was not stupid though. He grabbed the man by the neck and I heard the guy scream as he let me go. The deli worker told me to go into the deli and I didn't have to be told twice. I ran in there and hid. After a few moments the deli worker came back in. He asked me if I was all right, and if he needed to call the hospital. I told him no, and I started crying. He patted me on the shoulder and said, I'll get you a cup of tea and something to eat, he told me. You're a pretty young kid. You need to call your parents? I told him no. I was going to the pride parade, and I hadn't come out to my parents yet. He nodded and told me the parade didn't start for another four hours. He said he would be off by then and could give me a ride if I still wanted to go. He had been planning on going too. <laughs> At that moment I was shocked. As I mentioned, I didn't hang out with many gay people or know any. I was a kid really, a, a small what you would call a twink. This man was six foot seven inches tall, muscular as hell and had to weigh a solid over 300 pounds. A huge African American man who looked like he could crush Mike Tyson with his bare hands. He was not someone I ever thought would be gay. His name was Terry, and yeah, we went to the parade. He didn't try anything or hit on me. He put me on his shoulders, though, so I could see what was going on. Terry and I became very good friends in the late 1980s. In fact, we're still good friends today, and 
He's a really big Killer Orange Cat fan. It was his idea to have me tell you this story. And it's a bit easy for me to tell nowadays. I mean, I don't have PTSD about the event. It was scary, but I made the best friend a guy could ever have. This happened to one of my friends. He came across a guy over Grinder, and they really hit it off. So they decided to meet for dinner. All was going well, and his date even mentioned how he broke up with the guy he was dating with and is now ready to move on. Well, one thing led to another, and the guy invites him over to his house. My friend, who is very apprehensive of hooking up with someone he just met, started asking this guy whether he lives alone, as my friend wasn't comfortable going to someone's place if they had a roommate. The guy assures my friend that he lives alone since his ex has moved out, and then finally, they head over to his place. They both shift to a room, and before my friend could get comfortable, the guy removed all his clothes and was ready to pounce. Suddenly, there's a huge commotion outside the room, and my friend hears someone shouting and breaking things. Apparently, the so-called ex was back and claiming that this guy was cheating on him. Mind you, this guy is very upset and banging on the door. I don't know how he slams the door open, and he has a pair of scissors in his hand. As soon as he sees his boyfriend naked, he jumps out on him in a fit of anger. Luckily, my friend, who was balls deep in fear, saw the opportunity to run, and he literally ran for his life. He also has no clue what happened to both of them, but his apprehension of hooking up with someone he just met has now turned to fear. Concert. I am a huge Ani DeFranco fan. I guess I became a fan for the wrong reason. I knew this cute guy who was a huge fan of hers, and I guess I figured if I got to know her music, maybe something would develop. Well, it didn't. But that was okay, I mean, we weren't really compatible anyway. But like a dummy, I went out and bought two concert tickets, thinking I could get him to go. I sent him a message online asking him, and of course he told me he was already going with some friends and... I immediately felt stupid. I worked at a consulting firm. A friend of mine named Peter had gotten me the job. I knew he was a huge Ani fan as well, and I asked him if he wanted to go. He absolutely did. It was the weekend of the Pride Parade, so we figured we would go to the concert, get a hotel room, and get to the parade the next day. Well, we arrived for the concert, and I was a bit surprised. It was held in a ballroom, and there were no seats, and we had to stand throughout the entire concert. I had never been to a concert like that before. And the building was also very old and falling apart in places. It was just different than what I had seen before. But the concert was pretty awesome. Ani just beats the hell out of that guitar. Well, guitars. She changes guitars after every performance. I would never seen such a good concert before. I noticed at some point someone I was pretty surprised but quite happy to see at the concert. I mean, if I saw this man walking down the street in Chicago at night, much less at a concert that attracts a huge gay crowd, I would have immediately been a little intimidated. He was huge, I mean enormous. He was wearing a shirt with a confederate flag on it, a denim vest and denim jeans. He wasn't dancing, but he seemed to be there with a smaller girl who was dancing. It was great to be able to see someone like that there, and that helped me drop some of my own prejudices. After the concert, we went to our hotel room. Peter was out pretty quickly, but I had always found it difficult to sleep in hotel rooms. Something about being in a strange bed just isn't in any way comforting to me. Eventually, I decided to get up and go for a walk. I thought maybe some exercise would help clear my mind and help me get a little sleep. I slipped out of the hotel door and then took the elevator to the lobby and went out walking. The city itself was a bit weird so late at night and early morning, no longer teeming with even the amount of people that there had been at the concert. There were only a few people around here and there. I crossed by in front of a store and this homeless guy asked me for some change. I hadn't planned on buying anything so I didn't bring any money with me. I apologized to him and he hurled a few obscenities at me. I just ignored him and walked off. I kept looking back over my shoulder a few times 
just to make sure he hadn't decided to follow me. I mean, I'd never had that happen before, but Elby's did worry about it being a possibility. He did not follow me, but he did get up at one point. Rather than follow me, though, he just walked off into the alley, and I breathed a sigh of relief. A little more time passed, and I finally decided I might be tired enough to at least try and get a little sleep. On the way back to the hotel, I noticed that the homeless guy I had pissed off earlier was lying in the entrance of the alley again. I did a deep sigh and figured I should just try to move past him as quickly as possible. As I got closer though, the guy stood up and seemed to see me coming. However, he walked into the alley instead, and the sigh I breathed after that was nothing but a sigh of relief. Maybe he was looking to avoid any confrontation himself. As I walked by the alley, my cautiousness got the better of me, and I slowed and peeked around the corner before going forward. That was a mistake, though, because I saw two men standing there for only a split second before being grabbed and pulled into the alley. They immediately pushed me down and began kicking me. I was wearing some rainbow apparel, so they knew I was gay and even hurled several homophobic names at me. I tried to get up at first, but another kick knocked the wind out of me. That was when they began trying to go through my pockets, which was fruitless because I was being honest when I told him earlier that I had not brought my wallet with me. This just pissed them off more, and I heard one of them make a comment about dragging the fag further into the alley and beating the shit out of him. I really thought those guys were going to kill me, or at least put me in the hospital with a serious wound. What the hell is going on here? I heard, and the guy stopped kicking me, and looked up, and saw the huge guy I'd seen earlier in the concert. Obviously both guys were intimidated by him, and they quickly ran off. I mean, that's how scary the guy was. I honestly was more scared of him than the homeless guys, but I was wrong to feel this way. He helped me to my feet and helped me back to my hotel room. He was even at the pride parade the following day. The biggest, most intimidating guy I had ever seen was one of the nicest ever. Never judge anyone based off how they look alone. I'm a gay man of 32 and living in Southern Oregon. I have a rather large following on my nature photography Instagram and Twitter. Having a large follow account, and even sometimes a modest size count, you encounter people who push the limits into ranges that are rather inappropriate. I've had my fair share of creeps who push the limit. Most of them don't phase me. It's easy to block people and ignore them as well, and usually after a short period of time they seem to piss off. Except for one guy. I received a message one morning from a guy in Colorado. He was 24 or 25, and he seemed rather nice. He messaged me with the usual, Hey, how are you doing? Being a down-to-earth person, I always try and respond and ask the same. Though, with the amount of messages, I cannot continue conversations with everyone, or I'd never get off the phone. But I did try my best. Usually, the messages are friendly-natured or oriented quite nicely, and the occasional flirt. But after this guy got a reply from me about how I was doing, he jumped right in. You're really hot. Where do you live? I want to know about you. I responded in a friendly capacity, saying thank you and that I was from the Pacific Northwest, keeping it vague. The conversation then changed even further. I'd like to meet you. When can I meet you? We could be boyfriends. Then it happened, like it always does. So how big's your member? Are you a top or bottom? Do you like being dominated? Being more interested in personality first, I read his message but didn't reply. I wasn't really interested anyway. I looked over his profile and there were little things that he would post that made me feel like I wouldn't feel comfortable talking to him, aside from him coming on really strong. Being this was on Twitter and I didn't reply, I didn't believe they sent red receipts and I figured he'd just get the hint. A day went by and he messaged me a few more times with more live comments. I'll admit, my Twitter is not safe for work, so I kind of expected it, and I responded him telling him thank you for the compliments, but I didn't answer his questions about the location. Again, I kept everything short and vague, 
and then stopped responding altogether. After a few days, he messaged me. Are you ignoring me? I mean, it was kind of obvious I wasn't responding, and still posting on my social media sites frequently. I eventually responded that I didn't feel comfortable with the conversation approaching, and that I don't give out my location and such. He clearly responded, rather offended, Okay, whatever. So I blocked him. Later that night, the day I had blocked him, I got a message from another account, just random letters with the username with no posts. The message went as follows. Why the hell did you block me? I just wanted to get with you. You're disgusting. Unblock me or you'll regret you ever did. Screw this noise, I blocked that profile too, without responding. He then sent me messages on Instagram and using my email from my Instagram contact button emails me too. The messages were along the lines of, I love you, unblock me or you'll regret this, I'm going to end my life, or that he would end mine. I reported these messages to Instagram, to Twitter, blocked him, took screenshots of the messages and didn't respond to the email with the same vulgar content. He messaged me from yet more accounts telling me that he has all of my photos from IG and Twitter and that he was going to use them to catfish people on Grindr and that I would regret blocking him. He sends me several Grindr profiles he's created with my pictures. I talked to a friend of mine who's an attorney and he wrote up a legal statement to send to him the you cannot legally use my photos to impersonate me, I will press charges, etc. And I sent them to him on yet another profile he is harassing me on. The long legal sounding warning message that he needs to cease his actions immediately and he responded with go ahead have fun i'm having fun on grinder then the messages got darker he messaged me the next day i'll kill you i promise you that and another message i know where you live sending me a google street photo of my previous address and my grandparents house the messages continued i'll hunt you down i'll kill you but first, I'll have some fun with you for a good long time. Then I'll chop you up into little pieces. I'd had enough. Being a stalker asshole is one thing. Ignoring the warning, cease and desist in impersonating me and threatening me is another. I called the local police department from his area and he used his, what I assumed to be real, photos on his profiles and I was able to find him on Facebook, although it may not have been his real name and photos, considering he had dozens of Instagrams and Facebook profiles with his name and the same photo, but with different info on each, to the tune of, I'm the former Marine on one, I work with the US Marshal Service on another, etc. Upon contacting the local Colorado Police Department from his area that he located himself, being from in his messages and profiles, the lady on the line told me there's not much they can do as the jurisdiction would be the place the crime is committed in, my state and area, not where he is committing the crimes from. She then told me to contact my authorities and good luck. I proceed to file a police report with my local sheriff's office here in the county of Oregon, but after a few months, have yet to even receive a response. Even after calling now, they state their cases are backed up due to COVID. He harassed me for a few more months and I have documented it all, and I still to this day receive dozens of messages of people claiming someone is using my photos to catfish all around the country on Grindr. A different world. I was born and raised in a really small town. I figured out I was gay at a really young age. As you know, sometimes, in a small town, it really doesn't help to be gay. They're not always as progressive as the cities. And this one was definitely not progressive. I was afraid to come out because I didn't know anyone else who was gay. When I was in high school, no one was out of the closet. So I was alone. And I honestly believed that I was the only person who was even gay in our town. My parents got me a cell phone, of course. I didn't have any restrictions as to what apps I could buy. And they didn't monitor me. After not having any gay experiences or friends at all, I heard about the Grinder app. Reading about it, it didn't seem like it was a dating app. It actually seemed like it was a sex app and nothing else. 
the hell. I was a 17 year old gay male teenage virgin. I was perfectly fine with it being a sex app. I was pretty disappointed when I opened the app up. Yeah, there were people on it, but only one or two people were in my town. And they were much older than me and not interesting other than that. The next person on the app was like 55 miles away. I got some people messaging me on the app, but they weren't anyone I was interested in. So I have to admit being pretty disappointed in the Grinder app. So when I graduated from high school, I went to college in DeKalb, Illinois at Northern Illinois University. It was really like walking into an alternate universe. There were so many people at the school on the day I moved in. I was required to live in the dorms the first year and have a roommate. However, my roommate decided not to go to school at the last minute and I ended up having a double all to myself. The first night there, I wondered what I was going to do. I didn't know anyone at school and wasn't sure how to make friends. And the campus was so lit up though. People were partying everywhere. People were outside. They were littering the campus at night. I had never seen a town, which the campus basically was, so alive at night. I found myself wanting to do something, but I didn't know what. I remember the Grinder app. Suddenly I thought with all the parties going on, this night might be the best to finally lose my virginity. Hell, there had to be lots of gays here and they had to be partying and ready to fool around. So I opened up the app and I was completely shocked by the amount of gay guys on the app. Hell, there was a guy 10 feet away. And that meant he was in the dorm next to me. And that was awesome. I mean, I wasn't interested, but it was neat. I went flipping through the cornucopia of guys in the app and felt myself feeling as if this was definitely going to be the night. And then I got a message from a guy I checked out his pic and he was gorgeous. Hell, he was a gorgeous blonde twink. His hair dropped over one eye. Uh, he asked right away if I wanted to hook up. You know nowadays, that would be a turn off. However, that night, it made me want it bad. He was further away than most guys though. And when I asked him where he was, I found out he was a townie. I almost balked, but I was really horny and really desperate, and he was really cute, so I got directions and decided to take a walk into town. It took a long time for me to find his place. He didn't seem to mind, though. I kept messaging him as I was walking through the dark town. It was so much quieter than the campus, and nothing was going on in town. He kept sending me sexual messages, doing his best to get me worked up. And it was working too. I don't want to get graphic, but I had to carry my bag over the front of my jeans while I walked. Finally, I found his town. And it was weird, because all the lights were off in the house too. I looked at the Grinder app and it showed that he was only about 25 feet away. So I guess he was in the house. I asked him why he had all the lights out, and he told me he just wanted to do it in the dark. He told me he was in the foyer, and he was going to take me and just do me right against the wall. <laughs> that did it. I wanted that, so I went up the hallway to the door. I knocked. He messaged me and told me the door was unlocked. As I opened the door, I was stuck between being really horny and excited and a bit scared and apprehensive. This all just seemed a little weird. I closed the door and he was not in the foyer. I walked into the house and he wasn't there. The app showed he was offline. The hallway was dark. I slowly walked down it. When I was about halfway down the hall, a figure stood in the middle of it. 
It was dark and I couldn't see it. He was like a shadow. I figured he was getting ready to slam me against the wall. As I was walking down the hallway, someone grabbed me from behind and slammed me hard against the wall. I was shocked, but at first I thought this was part of the fantasy. But then the man down the hall started walking towards us. I hadn't agreed to a threesome. The guy behind me unzipped and unbuttoned my jeans, pushing them down. He told me to step out of them and I did. I was standing there wearing a pair of blue Andrew Christian briefs. My heart was beating fast, but then I felt something cold against my skin. Cut it off, the man walking down the hall said. My eyes grew wide as I realized what was downstairs was a knife and I realized I had been tricked. Hold still, faggot. The man holding me whispered in my ear, If you don't, I'm going to do this slowly. I reacted. I didn't even mean to. I kicked backwards and I missed, but somehow the miss was what helped me. My foot, coming back, knocked up against his ankle and he fell over a bit. My phone and wallet were in my messenger bag on my arm so I could leave my designer jeans on the floor. He lost his pressure on me, and I was able to run towards the door. The second guy came running at me. I saw him in the hallway mirror. When I got to the front door, he actually got a hold of me. He grabbed my underwear with one hand. I cringed. I felt the knife in my crotch again. I thought I was going to lose my dick, and I never even lost my virginity. I struggled and hit and kicked and stomped in an effort to keep my dick, and in my struggles, my Andrew Christians ripped, and they ripped right off my body, freeing me, and I was able to get out of the door, down the hallway, and onto the sidewalk. The guys came after me, but when I got to the sidewalk and booked it, my dick flapping in the breeze, I got away. I didn't even try to cover it as I ran. When I got back to campus, there were tons of people there, and my nudity was noticed very quickly. I tried covering up with my bag, but someone playfully took it from me. My shirt was quickly removed too, leaving me totally nude. I was telling people that someone was trying to mutilate me, but no one listened. When I finally got my bag back, I took my totally nude body back to my dorm. Everybody was slapping my ass and a few people grabbing my exposed dick as I ran by. For the first time in my life, I felt like a piece of meat. I reported this to the police, and they went to the house, which was empty and for sale. They said these sort of things have happened before, but I was the one who got closest to losing my dick. Fortunately, I didn't, and I eventually got to use it. But I was also teased for a full semester for being naked that night. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed these stories. And if you've listened to this one, maybe you've heard story number eight. What did you think? Did you think it was too much for the video? I listened to it and I, I had to include it. Even though it's a lot more graphic than I usually put in a video. Um, I think it really, it's a really, I just think it's a really good story. And I hope that you like it. I would love for you to hear more stories. I actually narrated some for Killer Orange Cat and you can find the link on screen now or or down below until next time guys stay awesome i'll see you in the next one